so pleased to see so many people and I can see that you are really celebrating in, in Dharamu. Dr. Cunningham. And it's my great pleasure and my privilege today to introduce Professor Cunningham once again in this hall to a large and wider and new audience. I'm really pleased to do that. Uh, well, it doesn't look like that I have to introduce Professor Cunningham by the number of people who are here. Anything about Buddhism and Buddha's birth? Of course, this many people. Anyway, let me tell you how we know him. He's is not a newcomer to this institute or Sri Lankan archaeology. In fact, he began his first serious graduate studies in the field in Sri Lanka in the late 1980s with so many other younger generation at that time. So now, now he is the Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of of the Ram University and he's professor of archaeology there. And so are we. We have gone from all and more intellectual in, in certain ways and less intellectual in certain other ways. So uh, Professor Cunningham is, is a very committed, I used this term yesterday as a very committed South Asianist. He looks at South Asia in a very wide sense. His work in Anuradhapura and in Lumbini and his very soon to happen project at Kapilavastu are the most important projects for us, uh, for Sri Lankan archaeology. And we yesterday launched uh, a volume on Amradhapura that came from Upper Malvasiyo Archaeological Exploration Project. In his early days, uh, Professor Cunningham presented some very controversial and you know, challenging ideas about the model of development of Amradhapura based on a concept called theocracy. Now he has developed it further and has an, something called blow density urbanization, whatever that means. Today, Professor Cunningham will speak to you on his work at Lumbini and then move on to Kapilavas. Is that right, Professor? Yes. yes. May I have the privilege of inviting you to the podium and to your lecture? Thank you, uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your um, interest in, in coming to today to hear the lecture. Um, for me, it's a huge privilege to come to the PGIAR and to have the opportunity of speaking here in Colombo. Um, as Professor Wirasinga has identified, I first came to Sri Lanka in 1989 as a first year PhD student and my teacher Raymond Alchin um, was invited by Roland Silver, the, uh, at that time Director General of uh, Archaeology or Archaeological Commissioner and under the auspices of uh, Professor Siran Derniagla, who I'm very glad to see again, um, I was inducted to the archaeology of Southern Asia and also the archaeology of Buddhism. So very much I see a series of, um, I'm not sure whether they are giants or titans, but certainly Dr. Roland Silver, Dr. Seneca Dandranaga, and also Dr. Siram Derenyaga, who very much developed my interest in the archaeology of Buddhism. I'm also aware that I have a huge debt to those who have collaborated and worked on joint projects, such as the Upper Mawatua Oya project, which yesterday we were celebrating the publication of Volume 3 of the work, and particularly Professor Gunnar who came to Bradford when I was at the university there and encouraged me to start a new project with him to look at the hinterland. And as Professor Wirasinga has said, we began to take an interest in what was now we see low density urban forms. And then finally, I need to acknowledge the input of <coughs> Professor Gandhi Adhikari, who was in a way the third, the third leg of the, the stool that we undertook that project. Um, what I'm going to do now is talk about some of the very most recent findings from the project in the naval landscape of the Buddha. And these involve three years of excavations at Lumbini and also two years of excavations at Tirupod Kapilavastu. 
all in Nepal. I will note that this project is a collaborative project. You see me in front of you, but actually there is a much larger team of scientists, of archaeologists. Also, because of the project, it's interdisciplinary. It involves planners, engineers, historians, and also the lay and also the religious populations of Lumbini. So although I am speaking, this is very much a broader project. The co-director is Kosh Prasad Acharya, who is former Director General of Archaeology Government of Nepal and is now the Executive Director of the Pashupati Area Development Trust. And within this work is very much my equal and an equal way director of project. And I have to acknowledge the support from the Lumbini Development Trust, the Government Department of Archaeology, and also UNESCO, who actually developed the program, and to JFIT, which is the Japanese Funding Trust for UNESCO, which has funded it. So, without further introduction, uh, Venerable Sirs, I will now start, uh, start the presentation. Of course, Lumbini has long been identified as one of the four sacred places of pilgrimage um, for Buddhists to, to undertake and to visit. And I'm an archaeologist, so my interests are also within the social and the economic context of the development of Buddhism. And this is a period at which there was the development of cities, of states, of coinage. So much of Southern Asia was at that time within a period of flux, and I think it's important to recognize that. As an archaeologist, we also have to recognize that actually there is something that we would call the Asokan horizon in that the Emperor Asoka was one of the major early patrons of Buddhism. <coughs> so monumental was his patronage of Buddhism that many of the early Buddhist sites lie underneath his monuments. So for example, if you go to a site like Dhammarajika Stupa, which is here on the right-hand side of Pakistan, what you see is a monument from centuries later, which is built around early monuments. So actually our understanding of pre asokan Buddhist practice, pre asokan Buddhist monuments, is quite poor, or I should say quite weak, because we've been unable to pick up those early structures. And indeed, actually, for many of our understandings of the sacred sites of Buddhism, we go to the Chinese pilgrims, to the travel itineraries of Faxian and Wansang. And actually, what's important about their itineraries is they provide distances and they also provide directions. So, for example, Kapilavastu is there at the center. To the east is Lumbi at a distance of 50 li. Now, the problem is, of course, the distances are different depending on which text you look and sometimes the directions are also different. So for example, these are Fazen, which is uh, 4th century, and when you look at Wanzang, 7th century, there are different distances, different, um, different directions. But using these sources, that is how the major sites connected with the life of the Buddha were identified in the 19th century. Mahabodhi in the 1890s, Sarnath in the uh, 1830s, Kushinabra, and Lumbi was the last in 1896. And this is a rather poor slide, but this is a slide of the old Lumbi mound before the archaeologists began to clear it away. And of course it was identified as Lumbi because of the Asokan inscription, which actually mentions the name of the site, and also Lumbini Game, the village of Lumbini. And there is the team who discovered it, General Rana of the, uh, the uh, royal family of, uh, of Nepal, and also Dr. Führer. Up to the 1950s, 
looking was still a very small shrine site. And these are slides taken in the 1960s by my old teacher, Raymond Dolchin, who visited the site in the 1950s for UNDP. This was after you thanked the UN Secretary General had decided to turn Lumbini into a suitable pilgrimage site. They commissioned a Japanese planner, Kenzo Tangi. Kenzo Tangi at that time was at the University of Tokyo, and he planned a new um, landscape, a master plan for Lumbini. And the landscape was to do with the movement of pilgrims from the secular world, from the bus park, from the museums, from the information centers, through the monastic zone to prepare themselves, Theravadas on one side, uh, Mahayana on the other, and then right to the center, which was to be the sacred garden in this circular form. And he was very clear, only the Ahsoka temple and the pillar should be there at the center of the complex, the sacred garden. Everything else should be removed. Now, it's one thing to design a model like that, to actually physically build one by hand, to dig it out over an area of three miles by one mile, is a process that's actually still ongoing. The master plan is not yet finished. But here you can see a slide in the 1970s when solid the levee was being constructed because one of the challenges that Lumbini faces is water taking and flooding, particularly during monsoon. There are also other challenges. When the master plan was first developed, it was developed for probably 15 or 16,000 pilgrims visiting a year. Most recent records indicate 800,000 pilgrims visit the site. Now, with such a growth in pilgrim numbers, it means the actual physical infrastructure cannot cope with those numbers. And particularly because the site is not just sacred for Buddhists, but also for local Hindu Taru as well, which is a sacred site. There was also an awareness that actually the archaeological UNESCO site was defined by a modern rectangular fence. The archaeology went far beyond that, but actually the legal protection of the site was only limited to a modern metal fence. So it was understood that Lumini needed to be redefined and also infrastructure needed to be developed. Added to that, there were no areas for prayer, for reflection, for meditation within the sacred garden. So all types of different practices were undergoing and actually, also, there was the additional problem that when pilgrims came into the temple, the temple built after 2002, every pilgrim breathes out carbon dioxide. With that carbon dioxide is moisture. The moisture settles on the certain brickwork and it, it then develops organic growth. So it was actually a conservation issue in terms of the long-term survival of the monument. Due to that, two years of workshops with stakeholders and experts pulled together an interdisciplinary team. And that team was drawn by UNESCO and funded by the Japanese government in order to actually strengthen the conservation and management of the being. It was geared towards conservation. Conservation of the Ahsoka pillar, conservation of the nativity image, and also the marker stone. It also involved a better understanding of the archaeology, because if power lines, if water lines, drainage lines were being put into the site, archaeology should dictate where they go, so they should not damage the archaeological heritage. There was an understanding that planners need to be involved in terms of planning where the walkways go and an integrated management plan. At the beginning, we were naive to think it was a plan, We've now changed that to an integrated management progress, a process which actually undertakes year after year, not a single plan. And then finally, we will gear towards capacity building for people at the site. For the archaeology section, a team, a multidisciplinary team from the UK, from my own university, 
and also from the government of Nepal went forward and they began first of all to map the site using geophysics and also mapping for the first time the site putting it onto a GIS structure. We also were very interested in the monuments of Lumbini outside the protected area. This is an aerial photograph of a police station. It's a police station that was built in the 1920s. It sits on top of a mound and it's located 200 meters from the Maya Devi temple. What we now know is this actually is an archaeological site. And we put an excavation trench just here in the middle of the parade ground and we found within the parade ground a sequence, here is the uh, SP uh, inaugurating the trench, and you can see this is the trench. We found four meters of occupation. What's most interesting about this, this is a secular village. This is a village. This is probably Luminiyane. This village is <coughs> occupied, interestingly, from 1300 BC. And what's interesting, it indicates Lumbini was not a vacuum before the birth of the Buddha. Actually, this is a populated area, this is an agricultural area, and we now know there is a long depth of occupation within the region before the actual advent of the Buddha. We also were working with conservators inside the temple. It's a privilege to work inside a living temple, but also it has challenges. Challenges that we were working on because the, the conservators need to alter the water level. In monsoon, the water level comes right up. This is the certain brickwork. So we needed to work out ways in which to isolate and to start draining the brickwork, and the first step was archaeology. And there is part of the team, the Santa Bidari, chief archaeologist of the Lee Trust, and also Kosh Prasadacharya from, uh, from Kathmandu. Now, what was interesting is, when we re-excavated the Asokan Temple, this is one of the first times that an Asokan Temple has been scientifically excavated. The only other temples, of course, were at uh, Sarnath, but that was excavated by John Marshall in the 20s, and also by Bayrat, which was excavated by Sani also in the 30s. So then we had this opportunity to use more scientific methods. Almost immediately, we found the evidence of uh, lime plaster. And what's interesting is it helps us understand the platform of the temple had walls the walls were actually built around timber framework, the walls. And the, the uh, plaster was painted white. So it gives us a beginning of an idea of, uh, of something of the color palettes being used. We also found evidence of roof tile. And the roof tile was all around the temple, but most importantly, it was not in the center of the temple. The center of the temple had absolutely no roof tile. Probably most surprising, underneath the Mauryan temple, the Asokan temple, 50 centimeters beneath it, we found a floor, a floor of an earlier temple. And the floor, you can see, is particularly well preserved here. This is the floor, that is part of the Mauryan wall, built right on top. Often on archaeological sites, when you build a new building, you destroy the old building, reuse part of the structures built on top. This is quite different. This building was very carefully covered by a layer of soil and the Asokan temple built on top by about 50 centimeters. Also, what was very noticeable was the bricks of this pre asokan structure were enormous. Each one weighed 20 kg. 20 kg is extremely large. They're about 48 centimeters by 38 centimeters. And we excavated in different parts of the temple, and we know the Asokan temple was exactly the same size as the pre asokan Brickbuilt temple. And at the center, where during the Asokan period it had been empty, we found defining the central place 
some of these bricks in a double curve, defining a central open space. And you can see, this is the Moria Temple very carefully covering the pre um, associated temple below. When we began to excavate and move the curve, we found post holes underneath, following exactly the same alignment. So what we have is a sequence, a sequence of a timber wall, followed by a brick curve, followed by the associated structure above. For many years, architects have predicted a transition within Buddhist architecture from timber to brick to stone. Here, actually, in Lumbini, right inside the Maya Devi Temple, we find this transition from timber to brick, and then the Asokan monument above. Now, that central area puzzled us because we were wondering why is the central area open? Why is it open? And if you look, this is the uh, section, and you can see there are a number of layers of soil coming at an angle. And we began to hypothesize, normally inside a building you get horizontal layers. If you have layers at an angle, often that can indicate root action. So we work with a group of soil scientists from the University of Stirling. They took a series of microscopic slides and they analyzed them. And they found degraded and mineralized tree root. So our interpretation is actually the space in the center of the temple was actually for a tree. Now, in a way, this should not be surprising. It shouldn't be surprising. And when we were dealing with the archaeology, we thought back to the papers of Dr. Roland Silver, also of Professor Seneca Bandranayaka, because they had brought attention to a series of boogie guys, a series of monuments within Sri Lanka, later monuments, but all of which had a central void, a void that they couldn't explain what was the function. So the interpretation, actually, we find, this is from Bulgaria, so this is slightly later, this relief from the railing of Bulgaria, but you can see this is a depiction of an early tree shrine. And actually, we shouldn't be surprised at layer upon layer upon layer, because all you have to do is go to Amaravapura, and you see a major tree shrine, where over the years, embellishments and structures above have been built. Now, this comes with something of a help warning in that this is just an attempt, a first attempt to predict what might we expect the early monuments to look like. During the Mauryan period, we know we have a platform in brick. We know that there are two slots for timbers cut into the floor and that there is use of whitewash. We also know there is brick, tile, sorry, there is tile for a roof but the central area is open. So this is an artist's impression. It's still to be, uh, I, I suppose, rigorously defended, but this is a start to see how can we start to predict what a Sokan architecture looked like. The structure below, the pre Sokan structure <coughs> below, this is what we seem to predict. We have a rectangular brick platform with these large bricks laid horizontally. And then in the center, we have some of these bricks upright, defining a curve. And then underneath this, we have evidence of a simple line for posts. Now, we published some of the early findings of this in antiquity in December. We're now working on the monograph that we will hope to finish this coming year, because clearly the sooner we can try to uh, publish this, the better. In terms of dating, what is fascinating are the dates. We have the Asokan Temple, we have the pre-Asokan Brookville Temple, and then we have the timber structure below. We have radiocarbon dates and also optically stimulated luminescence dates from the timber structure and it gives us dates of the 6th century BC. Underneath that, before any human structures were built, we have evidence that it was farmland, that people were cultivating the soil. 
What is also interesting is we find northern black polishware, as one would expect, but also in the early layers we have cording presswares. Cording presswares which are very much a regional middle ganga culture, which is fascinating because actually the site has very much a regional character in the early years before the Asokan um, development. Now, part of our project was geared towards capacity building. The Department of Archaeology, University of Dragoovan, has no field training course. Therefore, every year we took 25 students from Dragoovan University in Kathmandu and trained them in archaeology, in field archaeology. Also, um, UNESCO sent a team from the Mumbai Development Trust and from the Department of Archaeology to my own university. We, uh, Durham has its own UNESCO World Heritage Site. So we actually live and work in a World Heritage Site. So we were also trying to share ideas and capacity about World Heritage Sites and also management. Some of this we were learning. One of the things we were absolutely clear about at the beginning was the temple should not be closed during the excavations. Because the thought that people would travel once in their lifetimes to the temple to find it closed, we found was absolutely impossible. So the temple was always open. Also, we decided not to have fences. So instead, we had prayer flags. So people could go up to them, but actually they were fences. And another aspect, we were trying to work with the designers to identify where to put new pathways, where to put prayer platforms, which would respect the archaeology, but also provide necessary balance to those who went there to meditate, a form of what we like to call sustainable pilgrimage, working together. And for future planning, with uh, this archaeological risk map, we've been identifying areas which have very vulnerable archaeology, and then areas which are um, less vulnerable, and therefore if there are drainage or sewage or lighting that needs to be put in, so they can be done. We're also aware of the potential economic value and impact of Lumbini. Just to undertake research is actually now, within the UK certainly, um, it has to be tempered with impact, social and economic impact. And we did a series of uh, analysis of visitors, visitor actions. Most visitors come to Lumbini and they spend less than half an hour at the site. So they come on their buses, they spend half an hour in the sacred garden, they are gone. Many of them therefore spend nothing in Lumbini, they do not stay in Lumbini. So there's an awareness now that actually there needs to be more development of a Buddhist circuit within this area of the Terai. And this, this is my excuse for sticking two lectures together, because we finished that's part of the program last year, and it was finished. We're now working on the uh, reports. The Japanese government and the government of Nepal then agreed on a second phase of the project, but a phase of the project that would not just work at Lumbini, but would incorporate Ramagrama and also Tirupur Kapilavastu. And so that is the new project that we just started um, and which Professor Gunnar came to be an observer this, uh, this winter in January. Turku Kapilavastu is just outside a rather small town called Tolimala. It's about 30 kilometers from Lumbini to the, uh, to the west. It's next to the Banganga River, and it has uh, the typical type of signboard introducing the site as Kapilavastu. Um, what it is, it's a small mound covered in trees, and here you can see this area is protected. But what's unique about it is its landscape, its religious and industrial landscape around it is extremely well um, preserved. Now, it was only identified 
through the location of the Niglihauer stupa, uh, the Niglihauer edict, and also the Lumbini uh, pillar. So using the location of those two, and using the Chinese pilgrim um, uh, descriptions, they identified, uh, PC Mukherjee identified in the 1890s the location of Tiruvokapalavastu. And the description, and this is typical historical geography as used by Alexander Cunningham and others of that period, was looking at the description of the Chinese pilgrims and then applying it to the topography of the site of Tiruvokapalavastu. So a stupa on the east, a stupa on the south, a stupa on the west, and a palace in the centre. And this is the sort of data that was utilised. And uh, Mukherjee also excavated the stupa on the east, which of course is one of the most significant because it is the stupa of departure. Deborah Mitra worked there on a mission from the Archaeological Survey of India in 1963. And when she was working at the site, she did a new plan. She found actually the mound in the south was not a stupa, it's a metalworking area. Most importantly, she excavated on the northern rampart of the site. And here is a picture of her excavation. And she concluded that the site was not older than the second century BC, and also that the original settlement was not fortified. At this point, many individuals began to challenge the identification of Tillerichot as Kapilavastu, and of course, then reference to Petrahawa, to Gangwarya, began to develop more of a, a, a debate as to the location. Rishu University from Japan excavated in the center in 1968. What they found were a series of very well-preserved buildings, but what is absolutely important, these are on the surface. All of the surface remains are Kushana period, so they date to the Kushana period. Mr. Rajal and also Mr. Mitra excavated in the site and they reported finds of painted grayware and they suggested actually the site extended into the first half of the first millennium BC. I first visited the site in uh, 1997 uh, for UNESCO and we were undertaking a survey of the site and also we did one deep sondage of the site um, a rather small trench, uh, as you can see. But what we found was very clear evidence of corn and press ware indicating very uh, deep antiquity to the site. And after the Lumbini project, it was decided to actually extend the same methodology to Tillerichot. And first, we went to the industrial area to the south of the city. What is interesting is this whole area is metalworking. It's an area which stretches about 70 meters by about 30 meters. What is interesting is the inhabitants of the city have shifted the metalworking outside the city. This is actually full city planning. Um, here is the city in the background covered in trees. This is the silted moat and this is the metalworking area. So in 2012, we undertook an excavation there. In one trench, measuring two meters by two meters, we found eight tons of slag, which is a massive amount. Also, this is actually smelting. So they're smelting outside the city. Heavy industrial pollutants are outside the city. What is most interesting is the dating of this. This dates to 400 BC. So at this period, this is a pre assertive period, there is distinct town planning already in action at the site. In January and February, we had two months of field work this year. So the areas with circles are where we undertook geophysics, and the stars are where we undertook excavations. And our first task was to try and map the site, because the maps we have date from the time of Deborah Mitra. 
So the first thing was to try and again create with an EDM a uh, GIS system for the site. We also used archaeological geophysics because when you're dealing with a site where you don't really know its morphology, actually using archaeological geophysics is a very quick and cheap way of recording this. So these areas, this is the city here, these areas in grey are the areas that we undertook geophysics in only three weeks. So you can see in three weeks we were able to do a large segment in the centre of the city, in the east around the scooper and in the south around the metal working area. And you can see the geophysics we were using, you can use it on grass, paddy, you can also use it in paddy and water, and it's really versatile. This, these are the results within the city. This is the uh, eastern gate, this is the western gate. The first thing we found is that when you visit the site, you walk from the western gate to the eastern gate. This indicates actually there are a different axis. So this is the interpretation. What we have is actually the city is divided up into a grid plan, a really clear grid plan. And within that, you can see there are smaller streets. This is where the Japanese excavated. And this was very puzzling because this was a huge square structure defined by walls empty in the middle and measuring about 40 meters by 40 meters right in the center of the city and so after the geophysics we were deciding which areas to excavate and which areas to start researching and also a grid plan and remember this is Kushana period the grid plan if you think actually grid plan cities are rather important <coughs> centers because they're extremely well planned and one tends to think of sites like Beta, near Allahabad, or indeed Sirkap in Taxila. We also worked near the Eastern Stupa. So this is the Stupa of departure. This land is all privately owned. There's a small patch round the Stupa which is owned and protected round by the government. Here you can see Duncan doing the geophysics. This is the geophysics. You can see we actually have evidence of a very large monastery surrounding the stupa. And it's a monastery that covers something like 600 meters by about 60 meters. And the monastery has the stupa, it has viharas, and also now we know it has a series of ponds as well. So for the first time, we're beginning to understand not just the morphology of the city with its gridland streets, but also the morphology of the religious landscape outside. And this coming January, we will start excavating outside within the monastery. Because at the moment, when pilgrims visit, they see nothing. It's just an earth-covered mound, when actually all of these monuments are there, and they're currently cultivated. They're not even protected. At the western gate, we also undertook survey. So this is the western gate of the city. This is the little uh, village of Shivagar below. And within the geophysics, we picked up streets. This is one of the streets. What's interesting, the streets are not paved with brick. The streets are actually just hollows, in a way, muddy hollows. But the fact that the geophysics picks them up indicates that the plan has been in place from probably the establishment of the first settlement there. And that pattern has been duplicated over the centuries. Also, and this is, for an archaeologist, the really exciting part, the settlement actually is about the Kushana period building are 20 centimeters under the surface. So all you have to do is start removing the grass, you find buildings. And you can see the preservation of these buildings is exceptionally good. Having worked in the citadel of Anuradhapura, where the final layers on the surface are often damaged by robber pits, reusing, the site of Tiruppa, when it was abandoned, it was entirely abandoned. No one continued <coughs> inhabiting the site, and all of the buildings were left. Also, the architecture is very interesting. 
none of the walls are higher than five courses. And actually, there are very few tiled areas. And the majority of the walls seem to be actually built in timber, probably with straw roofs. So it gives us a very different idea of vernacular architecture at this time, developed, of course, for the Terai. This is another of the challenges of managing the site. This is the pathway from the western gate to the eastern gate. And you can see, because the monuments are so close to the surface, wherever people walk, they find buildings. So you can see this major building was just being uh, destroyed by people. So we opened up a trench there. And actually what we seem to have found is a series of houses and then this structure on its own. And again, we're going to be excavating that structure to see what nature of structure, religious or secular, um, this, uh, this coming winter. Now, also, as I mentioned, there was this very large square measuring about 40 meters by 40 meters in the center of the city. The interior of it was absolutely empty. So we put a trench into it. And what we found is actually it's a pond. It's a pond in the center of the city. It's actually built into the infrastructure of the city. You have streets running around it, and it's a pond. And again, from Orgogorin, it seems to have been there from the initial occupation of the site. And what's interesting, you don't normally get these sorts of features within city sites. Now, you do, certainly within the Kathmandu Valley, and we're trying to now bridge that gap between the archaeology of the Kathmandu Valley and the archaeology of the Prashana period down within the Terai. We also felt that we had to go back to the trenches of Devlamitra, because if you remember, there were two conclusions that Devlamitra reached in the 1960s. One was that the early settlement was not fortified. The second, there was no occupation before the second century BC, which of course would remove it from possible identification with ancient Kapilavastu. So this is Devlamitra's old trench from the 1960s. And what is interesting is Devlamitra left this central area unexcavated. She left it as a port, what we call as a port in archaeology. So she excavated the inside of the rampart. She excavated the outside of the rampart. But she never cut through the rampart itself. She left it unexcavated. And in her interpretation, she wrote pre-fortification phase. So she identified a brick-built fortification at the top, the Shana period, a clay rampart, and then she said before then, the settlement was not fortified, it could not be a city. We decided to re-excavate, and also we extended by five meters her old trench in January. Um, and here you can see Professor Gunnar Mordner um, standing in the, in the trench. And this is Devlamitra's trench here on the right-hand side. And we opened up a new trench to its side. We confirmed some of Devlamitra's findings. At the top, we found evidence of brickwork. That was the Kushana city wall built on top. Underneath it, you can see we have this very smooth clay rampart. And this has material, Shunga period material, probably Shunga period. What was really fascinating was when we excavated and removed the clay rampart into the area that Devlamitra had identified as pre-fortification, at the bottom we found evidence of a timber palisade. Now, you can see very clearly, this is clay, this is clay, this is fill. So someone had dug a trench, put stakes in, and then filled it with clay. We now know, actually, this is two phases of walls. So the early walls of the city site were actually trenches with large posts, which then were rounded. Now, we're waiting for the radiocarbon dates, but again, we've been recovering cord impressed pottery, which for us gives us a link 
not only to our own deep excavations within the, uh, the site of Turaco Capilavastu, but also gives us a link to Lumbini as well. But this sort of evidence is really fascinating, demonstrating this was a site which from the very origins was fortified. And it was fortified in actually quite a, uh, I'll use archaic style, before the mud, the clay rampart, that was very definitely a wall of timber, a timber fortification. So again, you see this prediction. Once we find the post holes, we find post holes, followed then by clay rampart, followed then by brick rampart, giving us a unique view on the military architecture of the site. We've also been uh, undertaking geoarchaeology because one of the problems with this area is water. Not, not enough water, but too much water. In the summers, this area floods very heavily. It seems that part of the reason of putting the rampart in seems to be because some of the early settlement was flooded. We have evidence of flooding in the early settlement. So some of that fortification wall actually seems to have protected the site from floods because we have evidence of water um, occurring as well. These are just some of the materials. Uh, we have Sunga plaques, we have some uh, Kushana type material as well. Uh, we also, if I remember, have 150,000 pot shirts which are currently being analyzed and worked on. We also have been trained. So again, we took students from uh, the University of Trebuvan in Kathmandu, and also we've been training uh, staff members from the Levine Development Trust and the Department of Archaeology. We also decided it was important to start recording visitor uh, numbers, how long visitors stay on the site. And what is clear is actually even numbers visiting Tiripo are beginning to increase. Um, and you'll see, you'll see something of a stagger that was uh, partly mapped against the, the Maoist uh, insurgency. But numbers are creeping up to about 30,000. Many of them Nepalese, many of them from Myanmar. But again, the problem is people are spending about 40 minutes at the site, coming to the site and going away. And so we've been working with the community there who've come to visit. They have updating, briefing meetings to see how to develop the site further. For example, there are some basic issues with planning. The car parks are not big enough. People are beginning to buy land around the site, often on the archaeology, to build temples or to build hotels. Asia Development Bank has just completed a major portion of road close to the site. There will be more pilgrims visiting the site, but actually the infrastructure is extremely low, and I believe there is only one laboratory um, as well at the site. Now, what we've been doing is actually working with the planners and the engineers, and we've been beginning to use the archaeology, the results of the geophysics, to start planning land use. So we have an archaeological core, a controlled area with archaeological sites in, then areas which are of the setting which will be agricultural, and then restrictions so there are no industrial developments. One of the problems within the Terai is as soon as a major road is built by the Asian Development Bank, you get industries buying up land along it. So actually restricting the usage of these and we're now working with the chief district officer, with the local development officer, to look at turning this idealized land use into an acquisition. So the chief secretary came down, and actually working with him, we're beginning to work up prioritization for a moratorium on planning, zoning land, so we can start to actually preserve the site, not just for a generation, <coughs> but for, we hope, future generations as well. It's not just planning outside the city, it's also planning inside the city. People spend about half an hour walking around. 
what we're planning to do is actually to start excavating and exposing structures, partly so people can spend longer at the site, so there's more to see at the site, and also so they're informed about the site. But these are not going to be permanent paths. Working with planners, the Japanese planning team, actually we're looking at having temporary prayer platforms, meditation platforms, and also temporary pathways so that as the research, as the excavation, as the conservation progresses, the pathways are actually flexible. Because if you think the archaeology is 20 centimeters up under the surface, whatever you put in that's permanent damages it. This way, we're actually able to adapt to the discoveries and the research as it goes on. This is the first season, so we realize we have barely touched the surface of the site of Turaho Kapilvastu. Next year, we're going to be working on the monastic area around the stupa of departure. We're also going to be putting in a series of deep trenches to start trying to understand the development of the site. But for us, there are some really interesting issues of urban planning, urban morphology. With the Kushana period being so close to the surface, we can begin to understand which areas were used for different types of craft activities, and also socioeconomic differentiation. Which areas had access to tile? Which area had access to imported ceramics? For the first time, at this very well-preserved site, we have that opportunity. We also have the opportunity to look at that heritage link, that potential link between the distinct urban planning and water structure from the site of Tilopo Kapilavastu with that of the Kathmandu Valley, trying to bridge that gap. We may not be able to bridge that gap, but it's rather intriguing to see this major tank built into the core of the settlement. And the ambitions as well are to perhaps test some of the work that we've been undertaking, Professor Gunnar Warner and I, in uh, the area of Anuradhapura's hinterland. There, as we presented yesterday, we've come up with a model of low-density urbanism, a model which is very different from the hierarchical model within the Arthur Sastra. What we would like to see is actually, is Turoko Kapilavastu the major city site within this region, or is it actually one of a number of cities? And also, if you think we have Lumbini here, we have Turoko Kapilavastu there. As both sites develop and begin to expand with importance, how does that affect differentially the development of settlements in those areas. To what extent do the settlements begin to reflect pilgrimage and activities? To what extent are they interlinked? And then finally, we believe we have a real opportunity to examine in detail the process of Mauryan impact on the spread of Buddhism. Because all of the sites, Nidihawa, Gotihawa, and also Lumbini, Tiroko, Kapilavastu, <coughs> seem to be associated with cord and press wear. This is this regional ceramic, middle Ganga type ceramic. What happens is that this is distinctly a regional cult, which in the Mauryan period is then expanded across the whole of South Asia. Looking at that interface, in this, the natal landscape of Buddhism, gives us a unique opportunity to see how did the uh, Mauryan period actually affect the organization and the early practices of Buddhism. This is the enormous list of uh, those who need to be acknowledged, and he has been the vice chairman of the Lumbini Development Trust, Sri Acharya Karmasangra Sherpa. Also, Mr. Dahal, the Director General of Archaeology, who's been very, very excited with the project. Mr. Powdell, the, uh, the Chief Secretary, has also taken a personal interest in the project and in what he hopes that actually we can generate. Um, so there are many there that uh, need acknowledging. 
And then finally, uh, I, I have to acknowledge uh, it was a delight for my colleague, Professor Prashant Gunavod, uh, to actually have the opportunity of coming and seeing how, in a way, the methodology and techniques that we developed working in the hinterland of Amarampura are now being successfully implemented in the natal landscape of the Buddha. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Robin Hanningham, uh, Venerable Sirs, ladies and gentlemen. If you have any questions, clarification, this is fine for you. This is a very wonderful presentation. So I am also a scientist. So in scientific context, I have uh, some, I want to get some clarification. Yes. First of all, I want to know the cost of your project. Number two, what are the objectives of your entire project? Number three, what is the hypothesis of your research project? Okay. In terms of the project, we published a paper in antiquity in December. So that project, uh, that paper, has a detailed understanding of our objectives. Uh, there is a UNESCO website uh, in the Kathmandu uh, field office, which presents our entire aims and objectives, our methodologies. So, in terms of the technical approach, it's all there on the UNESCO website. So, I would direct you to look at the UNESCO website. At the beginning, I said the objectives are to enhance the management and conservation of Mudmi and also other sites within the uh, natal landscape of the Buddha. Our own archaeological uh, identification had been to characterize and date and map the archaeological remains, so then that mapping can inform the conservation and the engineering and planning needs. So the data is all there on the websites. Those are our working hypothesis because if we had merely had an academic hypothesis, to undertake this work would have been very short-sighted. To work side by side with planners, with conservators, and also with those responsible for managing the sites, that is the interdisciplinary nature of the project. Cost is the entire cost of the project. Sorry? The entire cost of the project. Uh, the, uh, the cost structure for the entirety of the project was 870,000 US dollars. Now, that includes a proportion which is allocated to UNESCO. It includes the running of field offices for UNESCO. Uh, my own uh, element is uh, very, very much smaller. So we have been very successful in actually obtaining funding from elsewhere. And one of the elements of funding that we obtained was from National Geographic Society. So we were aware of the importance of working at the site, and we were aware also that this was a unique opportunity, and probably the only opportunity that we have of working inside the temple. So we wanted to make sure that whatever we did was actually filmed. So our excavation, for example, of the post holes for that earliest structure, that was filmed, time-lapse photography. You can see as the post holes are steadily excavated, there is an hour-long film which you can actually see the project as it developed. Um, we were very lucky, they were generous. Uh, I also persuaded my Vice Chancellor to donate my time and the time of all of the UK researchers. So all of their costs were covered by my university. So what we've been doing is we've been accepting donations, we've been applying for grants. Um, would I have wanted more funding for the project? Yes. Um, the site of Tillerico, I'm aware that the portion of funding we have is, is challenging. Um, but it, in a way, I feel that the, the work that we've done more 
than justifies that expenditure. And, but I have to stress that I'm extremely grateful to the Japanese Sons in Trust for UNESCO for actually supporting this important work to protect the site. Can I ask you to expand a bit about the uh, carbon dates that you got from the temple and Lumini mm. and what that signifies? Yeah, okay. The dating, we have we had a view that if we use one technique of dating, it really is insufficient. And I had a long discussion with Dr. Derny Adler yesterday evening, and we were discussing the various merits of dating techniques. Radiocarbon dating used to be the most advanced method of dating because a piece of bone or a piece of carbonized timber you can actually identify the date from the analysis. Now, what is clear is there are some challenges with radiocarbon dating because bone and charcoal are quite resilient. By snake holes, rat holes, movement of the soil, samples can go up and samples can go down. Similarly, you only ever get a range because you have to map it against an extremely wobbly curve. And at the intersection of the curve, you, you present the date. So radiocarbon dating on its own, we felt, was not good enough. Radiocarbon dating has the advantage that it's cheaper. Um, for us, it, it costs about uh, £150. We use also another type of dating, optically stimulated luminescence dating. And that is dating of soil. And the importance is, when a piece of charcoal or bone can go up or down the sequence, soil does not. Soil is actually in situ. And it works on the energy within the soil. So it works on radiation and energy. And some of the work that we, had, we were working on this, actually we were using in the around in the hinterland of Amaranthura, so we're using both sets of data. And for us, consistently, we know, for example, that the area of Lumbini was occupied from 1300 BC onwards, and that that earliest structure was dated to the 6th century BC. Now, we published that data. The data is all published in the Journal of Antiquity. We're absolutely clear that what we have is a transparency of reporting. We are now working on the final one graph where we are taking all of the data into account because we have now probably about 40 radiocarbon dates and OSL dates for the site as a whole. So our preliminary findings are still, we believe, supported. It suggests that that earlier timber structure dates to the 6th century BC. What sort of error do you get under carbon dates? Um, within the carbon dates, uh, if, well, if you, it depends if you use Bayesian statistics. If you use Bayesian statistics, which identifies the relationship, the error bar is hugely reduced. If you take a single date in isolation, the error bars are large, which is why we use Bayesian statistics. There is a complexity in terms of combining Bayesian statistics and OSL dating, and that's something we're modeling now. So we hope that within 18 months, the monograph will be out. And as with the monograph on the hinterland of Amaranthura, we will present the data so that in a way that other people can test it and interpret it as well. Yes, we, we um, one of the slides I cut out because uh, the lecture was going to turn into a two-hour lecture. I've been cutting slides out. And one of the activities that we had was to try and inform the planners of the modern garden in terms of what, what endemic species are there. 
So we did a series of auger calls, partly to identify how large the site was under the surface, and we picked up part of an ancient river channel. So to the north of, uh, to the northwest of the temple, under the ground, you can't see it on the surface, there is an old river channel, a river channel that might be about 30 meters wide, and the bottom of the channel is about four meters deep. So we cut a trench into the, uh, the old river channel, and we've taken out samples to work on pollen. Initial findings are no pollen has survived, but there do seem to be some phytoliths. So what we're now trying to do is to identify the phytoliths so we can begin to understand what sort of trees and plants were growing there. The other project that we're working on is we're testing to see whether you can identify the species of a tree from the oil in the leaves. So working with the University of Stirling and the research laboratories of the Scottish universities, we're undertaking a study of the oils and the fats in different species of trees to see are they sufficiently different so that when they rot in an archaeological context, can we tell them apart? Now this is, this is a new technique it's still being undertaken, but uh, I'm, I'm interested to see whether it will be possible. Uh, there are limits to archaeological science, I, I am aware. First, please, by I. So, the first, I question the first question because now as a scientist, we look at the outcome of the entire research project and how it contributes to the finding a solution for the burning questions of the human being. Do you think that outcome can help to the sustainability of the human um, What do I think? The funds in trust for UNESCO are funds in trust that the government of uh, Japan has pledged to support UNESCO projects. So in terms of the funds in trust for UNESCO, uh, they have invested in reconstructing the Bamiyan Buddhas. Now, I could question you and ask you, if you are a research scholar, what is your evaluation of the importance of the reconstruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas? They are also working on the rehabilitation and the conservation of Angkor Wat. Again, I could ask you, as a research scholar, what do you believe is the exact benefit of that work. As an archaeologist and working with a team of planners, because what you see is the archaeology. This whole project funded infrastructure, it funded conservation, major conservation, which meant bringing in special apparatus, which meant bringing in special material, for instance, the marker stone had been turned green from biological growth. Therefore, an entire two-year study of the temperature and humidity and water within the temple was undertaken with specialist remote sensors. So, if $870,000 had been spent purely on an archaeological project, I would say this is not value for money. For a holistic project, bringing together planning, building of pathways, visitor interpretation, uh, in terms of the archaeology and the conservation. Yes, I think it is. Yes. And the donor, who is the Japanese government, who have these funds for UNESCO, they have awarded the project the highest level of satisfaction and value for money. So, you know, my, my answer is quite, quite frank to you. And if we have played part of a role in protecting and enhancing the site for 800,000 pilgrims a year, I, I think that's a success. Yes, yes. <laughs> 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 
this is a contribution that we managed the entire humanity. Leave alone the Buddhist world. Yes. And even we are very happy that we know each other a long time. Yes. We can work with the university because yes. I was And also we met with Gerard. Yes. Now our boss became a prime minister in Gujarat. Yes. <laughs> and yes. uh, the media is now uh, helping these projects. In Odisha, we had the reason that they had conference in yes. Gujarat. And uh, they are trying to find uh, the excavation to uh, show many things they can yes. get from the earth. And uh, I am very happy that we are very keen to know what is uh, happening in future. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, contribution to this field. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, uh, in fact, we have another exciting event. Uh, Mr. Sirisa Manjee Tunga has written a, a book in Singhana Media on uh, Lumbini. So, uh, I met Sirisa Manjee to give this book to Professor Kanenya. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we think that you have a fair idea on the Lumbini and Kapila Pasu. Before winding up, uh, there's a video you have to be all to join the team in the outside of the auditorium. Thank you very much for your coming for the lecture. Thank you.